things a little bit different in the recording room. Appreciate all the work those guys do, and I won't take up any more of Wesley's time. We're going to do this in class, Wesley? Yes. Okay, so if you have any questions or anything during the class, just be like a normal Sunday school class. The only thing is, in order to get that beautiful smile on the camera, we have to get him up here behind the pulpit. But uh, this will take, uh, handle this as a regular Sunday school hour. Uh, Wesley, I believe the first bell rings at 15 till and the second one at 10 till. I'll give you a high sign on the five minute. Okay. All right, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe it's six o'clock, but I believe Brother John Sutton is. I've got it on the flyer back there. Let me go make sure. That I'd like to know because I'd like to be here. <laughs> All right. Thank you much for staying for our Bible class. Now, I wanted to be on the floor, but it won't work with the cameras. I feel like by being on the floor, you feel more comfortable participating. And as I go along, and you have a question, raise your hands. Now, I have uh, a little hearing problem, so if I don't hear you, I'll get Ron to tell me what the question is, and for the sake of the uh, DVD, I'll probably repeat it so that people who are watching the DVD will also know what the question is. We're going to be talking about the rich man and Lazarus and some wonderful truths that we can learn from the rich man and Lazarus. This account is found in Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at, the, at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. If I gave you a choice of which of those two men you'd rather be, which had you rather be? One was rich, fared sumptuously every day, docked out in purple. I can't imagine having a body full of sores. And apparently he didn't, wasn't able to walk. He was laid at the rich man's gate. And he begged for the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now we're going to see that both are going to die. And it's appointed unto man once to die, according to the Bible. The Bible says then, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. I want you to notice it does not say Lazarus was buried. And there's a good chance he probably wasn't. He might have been just carried out and thrown on a dump somewhere. I mean, he's poor. He can't feed himself. His body is diseased. The rich man do doesn't care anything about him. Now, I, I got a sermon that I preach, and I'm going to develop it even to a greater degree. And that's the beauty of death. I do not believe that you and I view death correctly. There's one sense in which I'd like to be alive when the Lord returns. Then in another way, I don't. And that's why I think if I miss death, I'll miss one of the greatest experiences that a human being can experience. What will you think about that? When the Bible says that it's precious in the sight of the Lord for his saints to die, Psalm 116, 15. When the Bible says that the righteous get an angel escort out of here, that's what Lazarus got. And he's not the exception to the rule. And when you and I can experience the Hadean realm and all the people that are there, I think death is going to be one of the most exciting experiences that you and I will ever undertake in this life. And I think we need to learn to look at it that way. And we'll not walk through the valley of the shadow of death by ourselves. The Lord is there. We lost our precious daughter, one of them, 
at age 32. And one thing that got us through it, she was a faithful member of the church, was pondering the beauty of death and what she must have experienced and how great that experience must have been. Well, that's going to happen to you or me. But now it can be a terrible thing if we're uh, ushered into the place where the rich man was ushered. Notice verse number 23. And in hell, that word is Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. It's amazing how that even when a person lifts up his eyes and torments, he hasn't learned some things. He still thinks Lazarus ought to be his servant. Let him come and dip his finger in water and touch my tongue. Let me tell you something. If you and I are so unfortunate as to be lost, we'd give anything for a drop of water. But it's not going to be forthcoming. When you and I take our last breath and we're lost, it's like walking through this door here and looking back and seeing a sign over the door that says, no hope forever. Now, some of us don't pray the way we ought to, but can you imagine being in a place where you could pray all the prayers you wanted to pray and none of them be heard? I mean, that'd be terrible, to say the least. Now, here are the various states of man. I'm going to try to move the mouse around if I can, if I can get there, here we go. When you're born, you're innocent. You're born, as it were, straight up and down. Now, what I mean by that, you're not leaning toward evil, and you're not leaning toward good. you got a pure mind that's got to be taught to do good. That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it that fathers are to bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, according to Ephesians 6 and verse number 4. Now, what if the little baby dies? Well, if the little baby dies, the little baby is taken over into paradise. That is the waiting place for disembodied souls for the coming judgment, as we will see right here. And this is a wonderful, wonderful place. I got a sermon I preach on the presence of the Lord, you know, and I got one on the will of God or wills of God. You know, you ever heard anybody say, well, God's will be done? What do you mean by that? You mean his written will? You mean his providential will? You mean his ideal will? You mean his instrumental will? What will are you talking about when you say the will of the Lord shall be done? Well, the Lord's will ultimately is going to be done. But here's the point. When this little baby is ushered over here, happier than it ever be, and I, I was going to tell you about the presence of the Lord. When you're born, you're in the presence of the Lord. That's one reason when we commit sin, we enter the world. There's only two places that responsible people can be, either in the world or in Christ. Now, when we're in Christ, we're in the presence of the Lord to a greater degree where he's taking care of you and me providentially, having things done for us providentially that he doesn't do for the world. Do good unto all men, but especially to them that are the household of faith. The Lord wants his saints taken care of. He answers prayers for the saints over here in the Lord's church. The Bible says, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man... Uh, be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him and hear us. So God has made all and put all spiritual blessings in Christ. Now, when we die, we're in the presence of the Lord to a greater degree. And then finally, when the judgment comes and we enter heaven, we're in the presence of the Lord to the ultimate degree. Right there with him. You know, the Bible says that when the Lord returns, Everybody's going to see him. But, you know, not everybody's going to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
according to Matthew 5, 8. If you're going to see God, you're going to have to be pure in heart. Now, all right, so the little baby grows up, commits sin. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. All right? Now, there's a couple of things you can do here. You can stay out in the world, die, and be lost. Or you can become a child of God. And that's what God wants you to do. Now, once you're a child of God, there's a couple of things you can do here. You can remain faithful and die and go to paradise, or you can become unfaithful, go back out into the world, die and be lost. Now, once you die, take that last breath, you are conscious immediately, either here or here. Boy, you're talking about a frightening thought. When services are over today, you and I are on our way home, get hit by a car, we're killed, and immediately we're right here. We're one of these two places, here or here. John F. Kennedy, shot and killed, bang, just that fast. Well, he's one of those two places. Abraham Lincoln is just as conscious right now as you are. I was a big Yankee fan growing up. Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris, both dead. They're either here or here, and they're conscious. And there's a great gulf fixed between them so that they can't switch from one side to the other. Now, the reason this is this way, you are so much like God since you're made in his image. There'll never come a time when you will cease to exist. From the time you were conceived in your mother's womb, you'll always be. Boy, you think about that thought. Young people think about that. You are an eternal being from conception. God is an eternal being always, from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God, Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. And so then, we see that God's everlasting. Well, from conception, we're everlasting. Now, if we're lost, we enter this place, which is terrible and torment, but here's what's really bad. When you enter hell forever and ever and ever, and you suffer pain and agony, if you're saved, you're in the presence of God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the holy angels, and all the saints of days gone by. What a beautiful thought that is. But Abraham said, son, remember. Boy, that's something that's going to kill you and me in, in eternity if we're lost. I'll remember all the verses I've read, all the invitation songs I've heard, all the encouragement I received from my brethren and chose to spit in the face of God, and now I'm lost. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. You ever thought about the good things you've received in life? How did it work out that you were born in America? I don't know. If I would have been born in Ethiopia at my age, I'd have probably already starved to death, died of some disease or whatever. You and I are truly rich people. You know, we think of Donald Trump and Bill Gates and all of those people as being extremely rich, and they are, but we're extremely rich. You look at all the third world countries. You look at the people right now, today, that's on the run trying to save their lives, trying to save their children, and all they own is what they can carry because of war. I've never heard a gunshot around my house that involved a war. You haven't either. How lucky we are. We've received our good things. But now, are we going to misuse those and be lost? Uh, we can become too materialistic, to say the least. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now the picture has changed. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great guff fixed. I showed you that. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. 
I know that's not true. Jesus was raised from the dead, and how many people have repented? You see, you can raise somebody from the dead. That doesn't mean everybody's going to repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, what we're going to look at for the next few moments are some lessons that we can learn. All right, Ron. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I can. Let me see if I'm going the right direction, wrong direction. All right, out right there. I hear you great. I, 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 come up here. Why don't you come up here so the uh, people that view the CD can hear you? All right. I, uh, I bought into this totally. The first time I read this, uh, it was a, it, you know, are you listening? What was that man? B.E. Howard. B.E. Howard. He had a track out on it. I saw that he used the proofs of Jesus, you know, where Jesus asked, uh, I told him not to touch me. I haven't ascended to my father. Right. You know, where did he go? So I immediately saw the truth in that. But Wesley, what I was going to ask you, I know that uh, the Catholic Church, for instance, believes that when you die and you're a bad person, you're not, you can go to uh, purgatory. Purgatory, And uh, then there's a soul sleeping, I believe, or maybe your witnesses or something. But right. what does your average denomination, for? I can't remember if I knew anything or believed anything prior to learning the truth on that. What does the average, you know, that you've run across on your radio program stuff, what do most denominational preachers teach about, you know, before uh, where we are when okay. we're dead? Okay. Before the judgment. Of course, now, that's a mix based on the denomination, as already has been pointed out. The Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, believe that when you die, you're like the little dog rover. You're just dead all over. I mean, when you see the body, that's it. Everything died. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you have a soul. Do you know you're made up of three parts? See, we usually think body and soul. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, I hope I got this right, 23, I hadn't planned on going there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, the Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, that's one part, soul, another part, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're made up of three parts. Now, I'm convinced the eternal soul and the body definitely are separate, and we can see that when one dies. The word death means uh, separation. And so that which keeps them together and causes them to function is the spirit. Now, how God gets that to work together, I don't know, but I believe that's the case. And when you die, the spirit goes back to God that gave it, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. The soul goes to the Hadean world, and the body goes back to the dust of the ground from which it came. Now, I'm going to answer that question. The average religious person, if you'll go to a funeral service, believes that when a person dies, if they're living right, they go to heaven. You know, uh, if just listen to them. Yeah, uh, and uh, read your obituaries. So-and-so died and went home to be with God. You know, that's what nearly every obituary says. Now, there's a sense in which that can be said right here. You see, but they really go to paradise. It's where they go if they're, right, if they're living right. Or if they're living incorrectly, Tartarus. Now, where did I get that word Tartarus? I thought, man, I've read the Bible all my life, and I've never seen Tartarus. That's a Greek word. And it comes from 2 Peter 2.4. Turn over there. I'll read it to you. In 2 Peter 2.4. And I want you to feel free to ask questions just like if I hadn't thought about Asking uh, that question, I'm sure it probably was in your mind. Notice in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, that word hell is Tartarus. That's the bad place where disobedient angels are placed to await the judgment. All right, so that's where we get it. Now, where do we get the word paradise? Remember when Jesus was on the cross? And the thief was talking to him, and Jesus said to the thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, Ron brought up V. E. Howard's track, where when Mary Magdalene had a hold of our Lord, 
He said this to her, Touch me not, for I have not ascended yet to my Father which is in heaven. Well, he had been to paradise. That's right, where disembodied souls go. But he had not gone to heaven yet. So that's why Jesus said that. And Ron said, well, when I read that track, I saw it immediately. That's right. See, if you'll reason correctly, you'll be able to see this and understand it more clearly. Now, while we're paused here, anybody else got a question, comment, observation? Anything at all? Feel free to jump in. All right, we got a couple. All right, one over here. Go ahead. That's right. <laughs> I believe we just heard a lie. <laughs> what do y'all think? All right, the comment was, for the sake of the DVD, was that being born into this world, rich, famous, beautiful, could be a curse more than a blessing. Absolutely. I agree with that. How many, how many rich people do you see kicking in the doors here trying to get here to obey the Lord? You know, the Bible says during the day of our Lord, the common people sought him gladly. And that's what we've got to realize. All right, go ahead. Yes. All right, here's the difference. The difference is when he told Mary not to touch me, and the New King James points this out, touch me not only. That is an elliptical sentence. Let me go. Uh, she was around his ankles and holding him, no doubt. Let me go. Touch me not only. And uh, the New King James points out that she had a hold of him. Now, in the case of Thomas, the deal was uh, prove. We, count, we call him Doubting Thomas. I, I kind of like to look at him as a man that wanted evidence. I'll believe if you show me. So then show me the prints in your hands. Let me put my hand in your side, and I'll be a believer. And so the question was, for the sake of the DVD, since Mary Magdalene was told not to touch him, and yet Jesus invited Thomas to touch him. Why was it that way? I challenge you to read, uh, I think it's the New King James, and you'll see that Mary had a hold of him. And it's an elliptical sentence saying, touch me not only. Okay? All right, anything else? But that's a good question. And I've had people ask that. In the New King James, that way, it just says, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Do not cling to me. Yes. She had a hold of him. And uh, the King James uh, puts it in an elliptical form, an elliptical sentence, in case you don't know what that is. It's where a word is left out that's got to be understood. Paul told Timothy, drink no more water, but drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy off infirmities. Well, he meant drink no more water only. He wasn't condemning the drinking of water. All right? Jesus said... One who believes in him believes not in me, but in my Father that sent me. In other words, believes not in me only, but in my Father who sent me. Okay? All right, other questions or comments? All right, go ahead. Okay, great. All right, there are those who, here's the question. There are those who believe you can change from one side to the other. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. Secondly, what about angels? 
angels that were in heaven sinned, well, since they sinned, if I go to paradise, I go to heaven, what's going to keep me from committing sin and thus being kicked out just like the angels? Great question. Tom Warren was debating Anthony Flew. And Anthony Flew said, will man have free moral agency in heaven? And Tom Warren said, absolutely. Now, Anthony Flew's an atheist. And he said, well, if man will have free moral agency in heaven, and he abuses his free moral agency here, thus commits sin, why will he not commit sin in heaven and thus get booted out? Tom Warren answered, because God has already looked at those who were going to heaven and spoke of the quality of the life that they would have in heaven and the way they would respond while in heaven and said the nature of that life would be eternal in heaven. So God has looked at you and me in heaven and realized that we would not commit sin there. Now let me do this. I like to do this. Let's take me and pull me out of this fleshly body. All right? I'm over here in my soul. I don't have the fleshly desires that I had when this body. If I'm standing over here and my flesh is over here, you think I'd lust for a woman standing over here? No. You think I'd lust for material goods standing over here? Have no need for it. Now, that be, might be a temptation with power. See, Satan got in trouble with that, I'm convinced. You know, See, there, there could still be some temptations. But, but what I'm saying to you, if we took you out of your flesh and set you over here away from your body and your fleshly appetites, what's going to tempt you for the most part? There's not going to be much there to tempt you. Uh, one of the blessings of dying, as I tell the congregation where I preach, is kissing temptation goodbye. Well, won't that be great? Are you trying to give me a sign? Okay, all right. I saw him look at his watch, so I was getting nervous. All right, anybody else got a question? You've had great questions. You sure have. Anybody else? Feel free to jump in. All right, now let me go up, and, 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 and I will deal with some of Ron's material uh, as we get here, as well as some of what y'all commented, commented on. Number one, one must be a good steward. Now, you've been entrusted with a bunch of material stuff here in America, so have I. A moment ago, you gave back to God as you have been prospered. Well, it was his. The Bible says everything on the face of the earth belongs to him. He's loaned you some things. He's loaned me some things. But you know, even after I give back to God as I've been prospered, you know who owns what I still got? God Almighty. And I gotta be a good steward over that. Now, the rich man was not a good steward. We must be sensitive to the needs of others. Can you imagine a man truly in need like that fellow laying out there, his body full of sores and not even caring enough to see to it he's fed correctly and help him? Notice the Bible says, Hebrews 13, 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers for Thereby, some have entertained angels unawares. Riches will not save. Like the comment made a moment ago, they might even tempt you to do wrong. I want you to look out in Hollywood and see how many of those people are seeking the Lord and how many of them are members of the body of Christ. And then sometimes we back up and let Hollywood set the standard on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and uh, our dress and so forth. It's ridiculous. And they're destroying this world to a large degree. We must be concerned about our soul now. It was too late for the rich man once he went to hell. We must be concerned about helping others spiritually now. He got into hell and decided he wanted to be a personal worker. I've got five brethren back on earth. It's about time somebody goes back and warns them lest they come to this terrible place also. Pain and suffering are real. If we have time in a moment, we're going to get to another point. Some people don't believe that pain and suffering is real, but they're real. Living for God is not a bed of roses. 
Now, if you watch the PTL Club and some other religious programming, oh, if you love God and send me $50, God will bless you and you'll be richer than you've ever been in your life. If you're sick, just uh, lay your hand on the TV. I'm fixing to pray for you and God will heal you. You don't find that stuff in the Bible. You find good, righteous people like Lazarus. By the way, Lazarus did not get to go to heaven because he was poor. He didn't get to go to heaven because he was sick. He got to go to heaven because he was obedient. And that's what we got to realize. And so living for God is not always a bed of roses. The Apostle Paul could take his shirt off, show you his back, and show you how much he loved the Lord with all the scars on his back. Look at John the Baptist, beheaded because he taught the truth. Stephen, killed because he taught the truth. James, killed because he taught the truth. Jesus, crucified because he taught the truth. And then preachers trying to tell you, oh, if you live for God, everything will be going wonderfully well for you. Well, not hardly. Bad things happen to good people. Good people get cancer. Good people get sick. Good people lose their jobs. Good people run into all kinds of obstacles in this life. Death exempts no man. Both the good and the bad died in Luke 16. I've spent hours and hours in cemeteries uh, doing funerals, but I uh, love restoration history. And because I do, I've been in cemeteries looking for certain people and so forth. You know, there are little graves, big graves, and look at the years some of them lived. Some of them died the day they were born. Some lived over 100 years. You and I, we don't know how much time we got. Death does not end it all. Of all the people that would have committed suicide, I wouldn't have thought Robin Williams would have been one of them. If you ever saw him on a talk show or whatever, he seemed so happy, but he was totally depressed. I didn't know that, and you didn't know that. I'm sure his close friends knew it. But... Here's a man that killed himself trying to get out of deep depression. Well, that, do, that doesn't end it. You ever seen someone that was very wicked die an excruciating death, maybe cancer, and then somebody say concerning that individual, well, they're better off now. Oh, no. They'd like to come back and go through that pain of cancer again compared to what they're in. I guarantee you. So death does not end it all. There will be no chance to obey God after death. It's now or never. If I die, wicked and ungodly, I can't, well, you're right, Lord. I have messed up my life. Send me back. I'll get it right this time. No. You don't get a second chance. One cannot pray to saints. Here you got the Hadean world and talk going on, but one cannot pray to saints. Jesus endorses the inspiration of the Old Testament. He said they got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Some people make fun of the Old Testament stories, such as creation, the flood, woman being created from a rib, but every bit of that's true, and Jesus endorsed every bit of it. Hell is real. Heaven is real. We're going to be somewhere in all eternity. So then... We got to make up our minds how we're going to live. And we got to make sure we live right. You only get one shot at it. Purgatory does not exist. Now, Ron brought this up. The Catholics teach, and this is a shot at the blood of Jesus, whether they realize it or not, and how good the blood really is. They teach the doctrine that everybody ought to pay for their sins at least to some degree. And let's say that here's a faithful Catholic he dies. Well, he ought to go to purgatory for a little while. Then they came up with a doctrine. They could either pray him out or pay him out. And they made money through that process. Well, purgatory is nowhere in the Bible. You don't get out of Tartarus. Once you're there, you're there. You don't switch sides. There's no way in the world that can be done. Now, here's some false doctrines exposed here. The Christian scientists say there's really no pain and no death 
Mary Baker Eddy wrote books teaching that you really don't suffer pain, you think you do, and you really don't die, you just think you die. Guess what she did? She died. Death is a reality. Pain is a reality. Jesus suffered for you and me. The Jehovah's Witnesses say hell is not eternal tormenting. Well, I'd like to know what the gnashing of teeth is. I'd like to know what went on in Luke 16. And by the way, I've met with them and debated with them and pleaded with them to explain Luke 16, and they can't do it. There's not a one of them that can do it. Spiritualism is false. Spirits cannot leave the Hadean realm without miraculous intervention. Now, some did, but it took a miracle to do it. Samuel came back and talked to Saul. Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. All of this by the power of God. And by the way, anybody raised from the dead, such as Lazarus, not just Lazarus, but the brother of Mary and Martha, he had to be in the Hadean realm at one time, and he was raised. You ever thought about who could be raised from the dead and who couldn't? See, the Lord could only raise from the dead to be fair. Somebody he knew would continue to be faithful. He could not put them in double jeopardy. He could not raise from the dead somebody ungodly and give them a second chance. He could not do that. Sometimes we don't think deeply enough to realize, you know, the Lord kind of somewhat had his hands tied on some of this. Once saved, always saved is proven to be wrong in Luke 16. By the way, who is it that lifted up his eyes in hell? The rich man. What was he subject to? The law of Moses. Who was subject to the law of Moses? Children of God. Here's a child of God. Lost. Calvinism is proven to be wrong. They realized the five brethren could be persuaded. They were not sentenced to hell from, the, from eternity by God. Director of operation of the Holy Spirit shown to be wrong. They had Moses and the prophets. Faith only wouldn't get it done. They could believe in God all they wanted to, but if they didn't obey, they wouldn't make it. Ron, I think I'm out of time. Thank you much, folks.